start with a verse from St. Luke's Gospel. Jesus speaking. He says, Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I believe there's a huge amount of irony in what Jesus is saying there, of course, because we are all sinners and we all fall short of God's standards. So he's come to call us all to repentance. A businessman was asked to read in church by the local vicar. And the Old Testament reading for the day was from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 39. The gentleman, being very busy, didn't find time to read it beforehand. This is how he read it on the day. In the ninth year of King mm, Harward, of Judah in the tenth month, King Hardward of Babylon and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Hardward, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city. When Jerusalem was taken, all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate. Hardward, 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 and Hardward. <laughs> And he went on like that all the way through the reading. If you ever read uh, Jeremiah uh, 39, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of those names are completely unpronounceable. And uh, when I was a young student in Durham, my for two tones was a, a chapel warden. That was the person responsible for, a bit like being a church warden of a church, but in our college chapel. And uh, some of our ordinands were quite lax in their getting up and coming to chapel in the morning. So if somebody didn't turn up to read the reading they'd been given, guess who had to read it? And guess who got Jeremiah 39? <laughs> I'm going to try and limit the number of difficult names and words and give as much explanation as I can in these talks from Hosea. But inevitably there will be some hard words You might wonder why I have chosen to bring studies of this book on this weekend. Well, simply because the Lord told me that that is what I should do. Initially, I was a bit horrified by the prospect because I've preached on prophets like Hosea before and it's really challenging stuff. Uh, Hosea, if you don't know, is one of the prophets, known as the minor prophets. Uh, that doesn't mean they're insignificant. It just means that prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah had bigger books. And actually, prophets like Hosea and Amos uh, are very significant. They just have shorter books. And this is one of the shorter of the prophecies of the Old Testament. So why study the Old Testament? Well, because, as you've heard me say, Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, is reported to have said, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. Now this famous statement expresses the remarkable way in which the two testaments of the Bible are so closely interrelated with each other. And the key to understanding the New Testament in its fullest sense is to see it as the fulfilment of those things that were revealed in the background of the Old Testament. The Old Testament points forward in time, preparing God's people for the work of Christ in the New Testament. Let me read from Hosea, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. A bit unusual for me, you might think, but uh, uh, 
um, it's very appropriate for me to do that, this at the beginning. The Lord gave this message to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshipping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. And the Lord said, Name the child Jezreel, for I am about to punish King Jehu's dynasty, to avenge the murders he committed at Jezreel. In fact, I will bring an end to Israel's independence. I will break its military power in the Jezreel Valley. Soon Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, Name your daughter Lo Rahama, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. But I will show love to the people of Judah. I will free them from their enemies, not with weapons and armies or horses and charioteers, but by my power as the Lord their God. <coughs> After Gomer had weaned Lo Rahama, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, which means not my people. For Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. When my uh, wife Philippa and her friend Rachel were in the early years of secondary school, one day they were at uh, Rachel's granny's house. And they, being girls from Christian families, hadn't registered the word prostitute before. They heard it, but they knew it was something naughty. They found Rachel's granny's dictionary and excitedly looked up the word prostitute for its definition. It simply said, harlot. They hastily looked up the word harlot and it said, prostitute. <laughs> they were no better off. It seems that the dictionary compilers wanted to avoid the issue. Well, we can't avoid the issue tonight, can we? Because Hosea uses the word in this first chapter of the book. And when God told Hosea to go and marry a prostitute, what did he mean? Well, it has to be said that the original Hebrew word, tisne, tisne, is not common in the Bible. And we're not absolutely certain what it means. But it has been translated in various ways by the different Bible translations. Prostitute, harlot, whore, women of loose morals, a woman of loose morals, and so on. Whatever it means, it certainly suggests that the woman Goma, who Hosea was told to marry, was at the very least someone who was likely to be unfaithful to him. And in the passage, in verse 2, we're told that some of her children would be conceived in prostitution, in unfaithfulness. So she was going to have a son with Hosea, but then go off with other men. Can you imagine the pain that caused him? Now I realise that this uh, might be painful for some of you, even many of you, but I must ask, do you know what it is like to experience unfaithfulness? I'm going to describe a couple of scenarios to help you get hold of the feeling. Two teenagers got hold of their dad's phone. It wasn't too hard to guess the password. 
As they looked at his texts, they saw messages from a woman, not their mother, saying that she had really enjoyed spending time with him at a hotel recently. They were scandalised by this, but instead of telling their mum, they told their cousins. Before long, everyone knew, except their mother. And when she was told, can you imagine how she felt? Especially when she found out that the woman was his teenage girlfriend from the past, his first love. She thought, he obviously doesn't love me anymore. She thought, why do I bother doing what I do here in this home anymore? Is he going to go off with her? Am I no longer attractive? What she got that I haven't got? Now another story. A young man in his late teens used to catch the bus home from college every day. One summer as he walked from the bus to his home, he saw a pretty girl standing at the gate of a house. He smiled at her and she smiled back. He was excited when she was there the following day, seemingly looking out for him. On the third day, he plucked up courage to ask her out. They fell in love. They spent as much time as they possibly could together, enjoying each other's company. They wanted to be married. Perfect story, you might think. But well, things were, for just over a year, until she went to the local college a bus ride away. One night, the young man thought that he would surprise her by meeting her off the bus. When he arrived, he saw her from a distance, with her arms around another boy's neck, kissing him. And he watched her go off to the boy's house. I wonder, can you imagine the feelings of the wife and the young man? What was it that caused the husband and the girl to be unfaithful. Impatience? Boredom? Whatever it was, it was the cause of great pain on those offended against. This pain was what God wanted Hosea to experience. So that when he prophesied to the people of Israel, he would know how God felt about the people of Israel <coughs> and their unfaithfulness in worshipping other gods. You will know if you've read the Old Testament that when Moses went up Mount Sinai, when he went to get the, the Ten Commandments, they got impatient and they made a golden calf. Worshipping other gods, they wanted everything quickly and instantaneously. They weren't ready to wait for God. They wanted to do something that pleased them. You see, and this is very, it's very vital, it's important <coughs> to understand this. God saw himself as being like a lover to his people, Israel. As being a husband to them. And if you read Hosea's message, you will see that clearly enough. For example, in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and you need to know, as I read this, that God viewed the individual people as children, his sons and daughters, and the nation and their future land as their mother, his bride. And this is what uh, God says through Hosea. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into parched land and slay her with thirst. Now, I hope you're sufficiently embarrassed by all of this stuff 
that I've brought out so far because it's pretty fruity stuff, isn't it? It's pretty scary stuff, actually. But it's there in the Bible. And, you know, a lot of Christians have not read this stuff. Actually, a lot of Christians haven't re read very much of the Bible, actually. But here, through this prophecy, you can see, I think clearly, that God is hurting. He's brought his people out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land, a plentiful land that God had blessed. It was once like a desert, but God gives his people a fertile land full of milk and honey as God himself described it to Moses in Exodus 33, verse 3. God saw himself being the father to the people and the husband to the nation. Yet soon after arriving in the promised land, the majority were being unfaithful to God, worshipping the gods of the people who lived in the promised land. They intermarried with those people even though God had made it clear that he didn't want that, because he knew they would be unfaithful to him, turning to honour and worship their false gods, their idols. I'd like to ask you, you might like to ask yourselves, what could our unfaithfulness look like? What could our unfaithfulness look like? Do we worship other gods? Oh, well, you may say no, we don't worship idols anymore. But is that right? Are there things you put before God? So remember, God says, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now I hope you see that Hosea's life is an allegory. It's a tragic human story that illustrates human unfaithfulness and so reveals how God feels when his people worship other gods, whoever or whatever they are. You know, God always intended his relationship with human beings to be a relationship of love and intimacy, of closeness. This is why I've always been a little sad when I have experienced people who have come to my churches in the past, they come at two minutes to, to 10.30 or whatever the time the start of the service was, and they rush out of the door at the end, usually grumbling because the liquor has gone on too long in his sermon. Uh, they don't want to talk to anybody, they definitely don't want to share the peace. Please don't touch me during the service is the attitude. And they're quite happy to sing a few hymns, as long as it doesn't actually touch their heart. Because God wants intimacy with us. And that intimacy, well, true love, you know, must be willingly given. God could have made the angels love him, but they would have been like robots. Instead, he created human beings with free will, the ability to choose or reject. He longs for us to choose him. In his word, the Bible, God often, frequently, uses human family relationships to teach us about his feelings towards us. He calls himself our Father, and Jesus taught us to call God our Father. And he uses normal human relationships as examples to express his own love for us. He compares our relationship to him as that of a father to a son or daughter. Also, that Jesus is the bridegroom, and we collectively in the Christian church are his bride, the bride of Christ. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, God reveals himself to be the ultimate bridegroom, looking for an eternal bride that will treasure him. He is the greatest of all lovers, 
Because as I'm sure you know, the Bible tells us that God is love. Love is not merely something that God does, it's what He is. From the beginning, He has been seeking those who will return His love from among humans. He has created us free to choose Him, or indeed to reject Him. He wants love freely given. There are two sorts of expression of love here, I think. Love of a lover and love of a parent, child. Those two sorts of love intermingled to express to us the breadth of God's love for those who we choose to love him. Among the prophetic utterances of the Old Testament, there are many references to the relationship between God and Israel as husband and wife. You see, God sees himself as wanting to know us. But more than that, he wants to, li- uh, wants to live with his people and to treasure them, to be married to them. And actually, at the end of the book of Revelation, we see the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven, dressed as a bride, beautifully dressed by her husband. And the Lord says, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will be their God, and they will be his people. That's the aim, that's the ultimate thing, for us to live with God, to treasure him, to know him, truly know him. You know, his covenant, right from the beginning, with Moses and the people of Israel, was a marriage covenant. He asked for their trust and faithfulness. But pretty soon on, they betrayed him and they continued to betray him. And the Old Testament repeats itself again and again with this theme over and over. You know, Isaiah what people's favourite prophet in the Old Testament, was actually a contemporary of Hosea. He prophesied in Jerusalem. Hosea prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel. And we'll look a bit at the historical context tomorrow. But just for now, basically, the two southern tribes, of Judah and Benjamin, and the ten northern tribes are separated into two separate kingdoms. Still Israel, but Judah and the northern bit was now called Israel. God as husband husband to his bride Israel occurs repeatedly in the writings of the prophets. This is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 54 verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. So the true God, the one true God, is the husband of Israel. And the prophet Jeremiah also has this theme of the Lord being Israel's husband. Jeremiah 3 verse 14. Return faithless people, declares the Lord. For I am your husband. The prophets also speak of Israel as God's bride and the Lord as Israel's bridegroom. For example, Isaiah 62, verse 5, As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. I wonder if now you can understand from this the profound meaning of Jesus describing himself as the bridegroom. Now Jeremiah 2 verse 2 and God says, I remember the devotion of your youth how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert through a land not sown And of course what God is talking about here is the people who produced the tabernacle, 
the people who showed such promise in their worship. But of course, as we started today, Israel turned to idolatry, and so did God became like an unfaithful bride, an adulterer. Ezekiel 23, verse 37 says, They committed adultery with their idols. And Jeremiah 3, verse 1 says of Israel, But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers, declares the Lord. And returning to Hosea, Hosea 1, verse 2, The land is guilty of the buyer's adultery in departing from the Lord. But what of today? If we have faith in Jesus, we are children of God. God becomes our Father, our Abba, when we trust Christ. Paul says in Romans 8, verse 15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear of him, Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. Abba means literally, Daddy. Abba. 